Hello everyone, welcome to this material characterization course. In the last class, we started looking at the transmission electron microscopy. I just uh, gave a, a brief introduction about the, the technique as well as uh, for the instruments. And uh, we realized that uh, the, the transmission electron microscopy technique involves a lot of uh, diffraction principles. And uh, it is good that we have the enough background about the diffraction in the X-ray diffraction section itself. So, I, I hope that uh, you will be able to appreciate this electron diffraction in a similar way without any uh, difficulty. So, let me continue the, the, the discussion on the instrumentation details about the TEM. So, we just started looking at the electron source and the lenses and then basic uh, operations and the types of electron source and so on. So, in that we are we are also looking at some of the details about the other parts and in continuation that we will now look at some of some more details. So, we were just seen that the details of the electromagnetic lens and how it is uh, functioning and all that and today we will discuss about the lenses, apertures and their relation to the resolution. So, look at the schematic what is shown here is it is a there is a specimen there is a the electron beam coming through and then you have the maximum aperture collection angle beta and then you have the limiting diaphragm and then you have the lens and then image is converging. So, we are talking about this limiting diaphragm and the apertures. So, some of the apertures and the diaphragms appear like this. This is an actual photograph from this textbook and you see that typically they are all um, metallic uh, discs which where you have the uh, perforation in the middle depending upon the, the size or the diameter requirement. So, typically the diameter can be as small as 10 to 300 micrometer and 25 to 50 micrometer thick. So, this is the typical dimension of this kind of uh, apertures and diaphragms and the discs are made up of typically platinum and molybdenum. So, one of the objective uh, ab uh, aperture is shown here you can see that a small perforation. It varies from model to model and uh, we will look at the actual size of this uh, strip, this is an objective aperture. When we look at the in an electron microscope operations, I will just show you what is this four different perforations will do to the image and uh, image contrast and so on. So, this is the information about the lenses. So, what are the control? What are the aperture and diaphragm functions? To control the collection angles, what is collection angle? This is the beta. So, they control that. In objective lenses, it controls the resolution of the image formed by the lens. The depth of field and depth of focus also controlled by this. The image contrast, the collection angle of the electron energy loss spectrometer, there also it is being used. The angular resolution of the diffraction pattern. So, the apertures and the diaphragms will have all these factors will be involved or it will influence the, the functions of all these parameters. And also you have the uh, various pumps and you have the diffusion pump and uh, ion pumps and vacuum pump and so on. I will give the actual details when we when I show the laboratory demonstration and what they do is. So, just to give a general comment the advent of high quality digital recording which will remove the need for the film in the camera will do more to 
improve the quality of the vacuums in the TEMs than any advance in, advances in pumping technology. So, today we, we completely record all the information in a, a digital recording system and some of uh, our microscopes still use the plate films and we will look at the details when we go to the laboratory exercise. And coming to the holders, this is how the TEM holder will look like. You can see the, the details here. So, so you, this is a barrel containing specimen controls, this is a, a boring seal and the, the section which is shown in the a shaded box is under the vacuum and this is not under the vacuum. So, you can see that uh, the specimen will somewhere sit here and then there is a, a bearing which will sense the, I mean the positions of the specimens inside the column. So, this is the uh, principal parts of a side entry holder that is held in a goniometer stage. So, the, the specimen is held in a goniometer stage in this orientation wherever we make a side entry holder. And, uh, you can have a different types of holders, whether you can have a rotation holder where the sample is uh, will rotate in this fashion and, uh, and you have the heating holder where you can uh, heat the sample locally to look at the uh, phase transformations and uh, uh, thermal response of the material can be studied thoroughly. And similarly, a cooling holder uh, you can have a quite a bit of uh, a heat treatment can be done and then you have a double tilt holder that means it will tilt in this axis as well as this axis. So, that is called a double tilt holder and typically most of the uh, basic version of this equipment will have this uh, single tilt holder which will rotate in this fashion in this axis, this is an axis and this rotate will in this fashion. So, uh, I will show uh, in the lab uh, all these holders, how, how they look like in, I mean these are all photographs taken from this textbook, but you can, I can also show you uh, in our laboratory how these uh, uh, holders are being used or typically you can, uh, if you look at the usage uh, rotation holders, they are being used to analyze some of the, you know, orientation effects and then uh, and then and crystallography uh, symmetry operation which which can be very effectively studied do, through this holder and then as I said for all the phase transformation studies uh, it can be used and double tilt holder is used especially if you are interested in defect analysis or uh, when you want to uh, obtain uh, a very specific uh, contrast mechanisms or if you are interested in identifying a very specific location and these kind of um, t holders are very useful, especially if you want to do a, a typical analytical work, uh, you need a, a double tilt holder. Um, for a, a normal conventional imaging, you can do with the single tilt holder and so on. So, this is a brief introduction about the holders and it is not that only a small uh, sample size can be kept and then you can also have uh, this kind of a big samples more than the 3 mm uh, specimen just for an information. And then you can also simultaneously load the uh, samples in a multi sample holders in a in a inside the vacuum. You can put it in a this kind of a multi sample holder also you can put it in the two slot holder and so on. So, these are all some of the varieties of holders which is available with each of the uh, microscopes. Now, how to see electrons? See, you have to remember that uh, what we are seeing in an electron microscope is it is a beam of electrons. Our eyes cannot see electrons. We have to resort to the phenomenon of cathodoluminescence in order to provide an interface between electrons and our eyes. So, the cathodoluminescence process converts the energy of the electrons that is cathode rays to produce light luminescence 
As a result, any electron displaced screen emits light in proportion to the intensity of electrons falling on it. The fluorescent screen is coated with a long delay phosphor. So, what we have to appreciate here is uh, we only pass the electron beam and which comes out of the uh, sample after uh, the electron beam after comes out of the sample must have interacted with the specimen accordingly the intensity profile will change as I just mentioned in the yesterday's uh, one animation I showed an electron beam passes through a sample the intensity will vary according to the specimen interaction and then that effect can be visualized only when you put it on the uh, fluorescent screen which will again emit a light depending upon the the amplitude of the light which which it receives that contrast also will produce. We will look at the uh, much more detail about this how the image formation everything um, in much more detail when we discuss the TEM imaging section. So, this is only to give you an idea how the electrons are electron beams are made into an image. And we should know what K V should you use. So, we have uh, a varieties of microscope with uh, different voltages of operating voltages. So, you always operate at the maximum available K V unless there is a definite reason to use a lower K V. And most obvious reason is a beam damage. Uh, if you recall, I just showed in the beginning of the uh, TEM lecture, I showed some of the images where uh, the specimen get affected by the radiation damage and I also cautioned you that we should not just misinterpret uh, those kind of a damages as a, a characteristic of a material. So, we have to be very careful with the that is why the appropriate KV need to be chosen. If it is a metal or if it is a ceramic, if it is a polymer or a biological samples, you need to choose an appropriate voltage uh, to examine the samples. We will talk about it much more uh, detail when we, when we go to the sample preparation section. So, you can always operate a 300 kV machine at 100 kV. The threshold for a beam damage for most metals is less than 400 kV. For lighter or beam sensitive material such as some ceramics and, po and polymers, lower voltage may be better. So, this, this comes uh, by an experience, it varies with uh, samples to sample. So, one has to really uh, judge this with the previous experience and so on. So, why do we always uh, prefer a highest K V? So, there are some of the reasons. because the higher the voltage operating voltage or accelerating voltage, the gun brightness is better, you get the better gun brightness. And as we all know that uh, from the uh, de Broglie relation what we have seen yesterday, the wavelength is wavelength in shortest when you when your K V is higher, the resolution is potentially better, the cross section for inelastic scatter is smaller and the heating effect is smaller. You see, we have to remember that when the uh, heating of the sample also will affect your, uh, you know, characterization purpose because that will, that should not induce a new effect into your material or you should not transform your material from the initial stage to some other stage. So, the heating is very important. So, you have to be very uh, careful about the, the type of uh, K V you choose before you operate the, I mean before you put your sample inside the TEM column to analyze it. So, these are all some of the general information about the K V. Then we will talk about a very important aspect of uh, uh, again a specimen electro electron beam interaction that is contamination. Vacuum can be a source of contamination, particularly residual hydrocarbon from the pump oil, which crack under the electron beam. Carbonous material then deposits on your thin specimen making it difficult to do a sensible high resolution imaging or microanalysis. So, this we have to be very careful and uh, any material which is being coated on your sample 
and then whatever you will see as a new feature may not be belong to your specimen at all. So, we have to be uh, careful about this. So, that is that is exactly the, the contamination is always avoided. Contamination also occurs through an airlock with the specimen. It can be minimized by heating the sample above 100 degree in a heating or a cooling the specimen to a liquid nitrogen temperatures. Polymers and biological samples can easily introduce hydrocarbon contaminants as they outgas in the vacuum. So, it is sensible to cool the specimen. When you cool the specimen, it attracts water vapor which condenses as ice on the surface. So, the, here again uh, the, the some of the basic idea of contamination is given, but then you have to take a lot more care while uh, preparing the sample for a TEM analysis. These are all general guidelines uh, within the column, but even before even putting the sample inside the TEM column, you need to be very extra careful, which some of the aspects we will discuss when you prepare, when we go to the sample preparation uh, class. I will just show you some of the live examples. Now, we will just uh, go to the some of the basic uh, uh, you know instrument and details and its uh, instrumental operation and what you are now seeing is one of the uh, schematic which shows the operation that is called a parallel beam operation. The first one that schematic shown here is you see that uh, you have the C 1 lens, C 1 crossover and C 2 lens and then it is falling on the specimen. So, which has got some the semi aperture angle is there alpha on the right hand side side you see that the beam is made parallel. Why parallel? Because some of your uh, you know diffraction experiments we, when you do only with the parallel beam you get you will be able to focus the diffraction spot to the sharpest as possible. So, parallel beam operation is important in a when you when you do a diffraction analysis. So, for that you need to get this condition. So, this is done by the insertion of another objective lens you have the which is a front focal plane of an objective lens. You have the another objective lens is there upper objective lens. So, which is being made being made into a parallel. And the same line you can see uh, another schematic where it shows the uh, how the convergence angle uh, control the, the parallel beam operation. So, for example, you see that uh, effect of C 2 aperture on the parallel beam a smaller the aperture create more parallel beam you can see that small the aperture create more parallel beam you can see that alpha you can have a different alpha will give you a different kind of a convergent beam. And then what you have to understand here is the, the nomenclature for the, the lenses C 1 and C 2 are uh, uh, pertaining to a particular system you can have condenser lens 1, condenser lens 2 and then objective lens 1 something like that. So, do not worry about this uh, designation of the uh, lenses, but it is you have to just see that what the operation of that particular lens and what is the effect of the effect of that particular uh, lens or uh, diaphragm on the probing uh, electromagnetic radiation that is all we are interested. And then you can see that a focused C 2 lens illuminates a small area of the specimen with the non parallel beam. Suppose, if you have the a focused lens, then you will have uh, a focused beam here. Here the C 2 lens is focused and this is a C 2 diaphragm, then you are able to get the uh, focused a uh, non parallel beam. So, just to give you an idea inside the column what kind of a uh, beam um, designation or what kind of beam conditions under which the, the specimens are examined. 
the convergent beam is a probe. We use such a probe when we want to localize the signals coming from the specimen as in microanalysis or a convergent beam also known as a micro or nano diffraction. This is again a very important uh, oper operations of diffraction. Suppose if you are wanted to uh, obtain uh, a diffraction information from the very localized region for example, a small uh, second phase particle. Uh, you just want a diffraction from only from that particle then you need this uh, convergent beam operation. I will show you uh, the actual diffraction pattern when we discuss the uh, diffraction in TEM in much more details in the following section. So, how the convergent beam operation is done this which is being shown as a schematic with the in the ray diagram here. You can see that uh, this left hand head shows how the convergent beam are obtained and here also you can see that uh, how a, a small probe and a large probe size are controlled by this uh, lens system. Uh, just to give you an idea, so you should have the uh, a large u by v ratio which promotes the um, a convergent beam of the probe. So, this is just shown with the uh, two condenser lenses, one is a, a strong P1 crossover gives a small probe and other is a weak C1 crossover will give a, a large probe. So, how to get the uh, micro probe or a nano probe is it because uh, the controlling the C1 crossover. Now, we will just look at some of the alignments of the aperture. So, we have just seen uh, what types of apertures and then if they are not aligned properly what is the issue. So, these are the some of the schematic which uh, shows that. So, you can see that uh, know a distorted image of a beam off axis and this is an optic axis, this is a viewing screen and the focused image of the beam on axis and then when it is distorted you will see uh, this kind of a configuration of the beam on the screen. So, here, here everything is focused here. So, you can have the focused beam on the axis and the defocused beam on the axis uh, on the this is on the viewing screen. So, these two explains how a beam is supposed to appear like ideally on the fluorescent screen when you do a, an alignment setting. So, this is just to give you an idea what is that alignment is about. So, if the C2 aperture is misaligned under focusing or over focusing the C2 lens causes the image sweep off axis. So, it could be under focusing or over focusing from the C2 lens. If the C2 lens is aligned the image of the beam remains circular and expands or contracts about the optic axis as the lens is under focused or over focused. So, it is completely aligned but you can just uh, under focused and over focused it will just open and close in a symmetric manner. So, then we can make sure that the beam is aligned in the column then we are ready to go. So, these operations we will see it in the laboratory and very importantly uh, how do we identify whether your beam is uh, having astigmatism. So, suppose this is a shape of your beam on the fluorescent screen then you you can simply say that there is some issue. So, you have this uh, distorted under focused beam and this is a distorted over focused beam and this is supposed to be a, a circularly focused beam should appear like this and if it deviates from this circularity and then it shows a oval shape like this either it could be an under focused beam or it could be a over focused beam you have to correct it for the astigmatism. So, the effect of astigmatism in the illumination system is to distort the image of the image beam ellipsis, elliptically as C2 lens is under focused or over focused. So, this is one aspect we have to uh, very important aspect of uh, alignment and uh, this is one of the major part of the operation. 
So, we will now go to the uh, imaging system and uh, I will just play some of the schematic ray diagram which will show what kind of uh, imaging operation one need to carry out in a TEM. So, what you are seeing here is uh, the first one is where a diffraction beam will be formed, the second one is a image will be formed. So, I will you, you, you see that this is a specimen and there is an objective lens and uh, you have objective aperture and then SAD aperture and then you have the other intermediate lens and then finally, it reaches the uh, screen. So, what you are to appreciate is when you want to record a diffraction pattern, uh, what are you supposed to do? So, I will play this uh, schematic again, you just observe. So, I have the objective lens, this is an optic axis. So, you have objective aperture and SAD aperture. Suppose, if I want to record SAD, then objective aperture should be removed from the optic axis, that is what shown in this schematic. Suppose, if you want to record the image, your SAD aperture should be out of the optic axis. So, you can see that correspondingly how this uh, you know the, the intermediate image is being uh, further uh, demagnified and then magnified and finally, it reaches the screen. And you can see that uh, how, how the uh, back focal plane again get projected and then how the image formation occurs. So, the two important a uh, physical operation here, one is forming a diffraction pattern, one is forming a, an image, a basic thing. Uh, we will talk about uh, actual uh, image formation in a in another better example. This is only to show that what kind of uh, physical operation one need to do when when you do an imaging, TEM imaging. So, this is a description of what I just shown. Uh, to see the diffraction pattern, you have to adjust the imaging system lenses, so that a back focal plane of the objective lens acts as the object plane for the intermediate lens. Then the diffraction pattern is projected on the viewing screen. Let us go and see. So, this is the back focal plane which of the objective lens will act as an image for the intermediate lens. Then the diffraction pattern is projected on the viewing screen. If you want look at an image instead, you read just the intermediate lens so that it, its object plane is the image plane of the objective lens. Then the image is projected onto the viewing screen like what, what I have just shown here. So, another important uh, imaging system in a TEM is uh, producing a bright field or a dark field. We have seen that in the optical system itself. So, you know uh, the basic principle of obtaining a bright field and dark field. So, in TEM uh, it is it is the same thing, but the schematic clearly illustrates that uh, how the, the bright field and a dark field imaging are uh, realized. So, you have the specimen, this is an optic axis and then you have the, the whatever you get on the uh, screen is uh, given on the 2D projection here. So, this is the optic axis and this is uh, also a, a zero order uh, zero order beam that is transmitted beam and then you have uh, a diffracted spot around this. So, when you want to do a, a bright field image, uh, the objective aperture just stays on this uh, transmitted beam and then you will get an image. But on the other hand, if you are uh, interested in taking a dark field, then you can see that the, your aperture is moved to uh, from the optic axis of transmitted beam to one of the uh, diffracted beam. So, 
you can do this dark field imaging on any using any one of this diffracted spot of your interest. So, each one will give a different different uh, information from a different different set of planes from the specimen. So, uh, based on that interest you can do uh, a bright field or a dark field and so on. So, normally this is done through a beam tilt operation, a beam is tilted uh, rather than a, an objective is uh, aperture is just uh, brought down to the spot, uh, a beam tilt operation will make the beam, the diffracted beam come to the center and then aperture is being put on that, then you will get the dark field image. So, that is uh, the primary information from this slide is you should get an idea, a transmitted uh, spot is being used to form a bright field image, uh, any one of the diffracted spot is used uh, to form a, a dark field image. So, that is the information from this slide. Now, we will look at the uh, other important uh, imaging system in a TEM uh, called a STEM, Scanning Transmission Electron Microscopy Imaging. So, you have the, uh, go through this uh, schematic, you have the electron source and then you have the condenser lens. Please recall what we have discussed in a scanning electron microscopy lecture, where we had the deflection scan coils. So, similar setup is here, which will uh, manipulate the electron beam according to the scanning action. If we have very, we have gone through the scanning action in much more detail in the uh, uh, scanning electron microscopy. You just uh, recall those aspects. Similarly, the beam will scan through the sample on the complete uh, surface. The only difference between the scanning electron microscopy and this is here the your specimen is transparent, but then the scanning action uh, is the uh, same. So, you get uh, the signals, again you have the detector and then which will correct the signal and so on. The rest all, rest all the operations are same except that the specimen is transparent here. So, that is one point. The, the right hand side schematic shows how the, how exactly the, uh, you know, the ray diagram looks like. So, you have the uh, pivot point of a scanning system, uh, front focal plane of an objective lens here and then you have an upper pole piece of an objective lens and then you have the uh, convergence scanning beam which scans on the specimen like this and then you have the lower pole piece of the objective lens where you can see the direct beam in a stationary diffraction pattern and a diffracted beam in a stationary diffraction pattern. So, you can see that this is falling on a back focal plane of an objective lens. So, you have the scanning, the convergent probe for a stem image formation using two pairs of a scan coils between the C2 lenses and the upper objective pole piece. So, this is exact location of the your scan coils between C2 lens and an up, upper objective pole piece. The probe remains uh, parallel to the optic axis as it scans. So, this is a, a simple uh, way of putting this uh, transmission as well as scanning system together and uh, you, you have to just, uh, you know, you can appreciate that the, the operations are similar to a, a scanning electron microscopy with regard to scanning action is concerned. But the difference is the specimen is here a transparent electron transparent specimen, where in a SEM you have only the, the surface which is being, uh, I mean you gives, gives out all these signals after the scanning. So, that is one point you have to remember. So, here a, a principle of uh, forming a scanning image showing how the same scan coils in the microscope controls the beam scan on the specimen and the beam scan on the CRT. Thus, no lenses are required to form the image. So, it is similar to scanning electron microscopy as I told you before. So, how the, the image formation occurs in a scanning electron microscopy is demonstrated in this. So, you have already a knowledge on this. So, I will skip this. So, typically you have the 
what kind of an image uh, will see through a, a stem image this is taken from this textbook again so you have the a bright field image and this is a dark field image this is called uh, you know uh, annular dark field image and this is a typical diffraction pattern what you have is you suppose if you have the a specimen and this is a, a scanning beam and you have the a bright field uh, I mean image can be formed from this transmitted one and this is a diffracted beam you have ADF is called annular dark field that means uh, suppose if you have uh, this is the diffraction pattern a ring pattern an annular uh, ring will collect complete the dark field intensity and completely block the transmitted intensity then you get this kind of a uh, very interesting image that is called annular dark field and then you have the bright field which is formed with this uh, image in this system. Please remember uh, a scanning transmission electron microscopy is uh, very specifically used for a chemical analysis very useful uh, in chemical analysis and micro analysis or the elemental mapping across the uh, particular location of the uh, material feature and, uh, and mostly uh, the, the probe which is being used in the stem is much more smaller as compared to uh, normal TEM operation. We will just show you some of the demonstrations about this also. So, as an introduction to this uh, course, you should know what are all the possible techniques possible in a, in a transmission electron microscopy. Uh, in that respect only, I just brought the, brought the introductory slides like this. Then uh, we will get into this uh, basic idea when we actually operate the TEM in the lab. So, now the another important uh, aspect of uh, TEM operation is. Uh, a camera length calibration the the schematic uh, which shows a basic uh, a geometry a geometrical relation uh, between the the distance between the specimen and the screen and then and what 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 you can do with that camera geometry so let us see that this is a specimen this is an incident beam uh, suppose uh, this is the back focal plane here and uh, this is a diffracted beam this is 2 theta and this distance is L and then this distance is R this is from the transmitted beam to one of the diffracted beam the distance is R then the, the relationship what we have is R D is equal to L lambda, L lambda. So, this is a very important relation we will we will look at that uh, derivation in a, when we look at the diffraction of the uh, di diffraction phenomenon in TEM in much more detail, but this relation is a very important relation in identifying or indexing the uh, diffraction pattern and the lambda L is uh, uh, kept constant always that is why it is called a camera constant lambda L is a camera constant and this requires some calibration for before you do any analysis your uh, camera length need to be calibrated with a standard sample and then it has to be fixed. So, then only you can use this relation for any of your diffraction analysis and so on. We will do a demonstration or we will work out some sam examples also and uh, this is the uh, a typical table when one generate uh, after the uh, calibration of the camera constant and uh, and I leave it there uh, we will use this parameter uh, when we do a diffraction analysis you will appreciate this uh, importance of a camera constant why I am showing this slide because uh, when you when you decide to use uh, this kind of an analysis like if you want to use a camera length uh, and then if then it has to be calibrated first of all you have to check uh, whatever it is uh, showing in the display in the TEM uh, display 
whatever the camera consumed, it shows we have to, we, we should not blindly take it up, we have to check whether it is calibrated or not. Then only you can take that value and use it for the diffraction analysis later. So that for that information only I brought brought this. Now I slowly move on to the other important uh, aspect in TEM that is uh, diffraction in TEM. <coughs> Before I get into this uh, uh, in a very exhaustive topic in TEM. Uh, I would like to just recall uh, some of the, the principles we discussed uh, about diffraction in an X-ray course or in X-ray diffraction uh, lectures. Uh, see uh, the, there is no difference uh, in those principles for whether in terms of uh, you know diffraction condition, we talked about a reciprocal lattice, we talked about evolved sphere concepts and then all this phenomenon whatever we discussed they are all going to be the same in this uh, electron microscopy as well. And then another important thing is the, the you have to just find out what is the fundamental difference between uh, the electron diffraction and an X-ray diffraction. You yourself will know now that only the wavelength is the, the difference because with the increasing, increasing the accelerate and accelerating voltage, we will be able to control the uh, lambda. That is what we have seen in the beginning of this course. So, through a de Broglie's relation and in X-ray we have uh, a much uh, higher wavelength. So, that is one basic uh, fundamental difference. Otherwise, all the diffraction phenomena are same. So, with that background you will be able to appreciate uh, some of the uh, concepts in TEM also. So, I will be uh, moving little bit faster in this uh, lectures, I will not spend much time because the most of the concepts are same. But I will spend much more time in uh, some of the important uh, diffraction experiments like uh, convergent beam electron diffraction or uh, you have the Kikuchi pattern and so on, which are very important uh, uh, diffraction experiments in the transmission electron microscope. I will spend little more time on that, otherwise they are all uh, uh, the same. So, if you look at the uh, diffraction pattern in TEM, uh, you, you have to just ask few questions. Suppose if you ask what is it and uh, what can we learn from it, why do we see it, what determines the scale, what determines the distance between the spots or the positions of the lines. So, something like this if you try to answer these uh, 4 or 5 questions, you will you will see that surprisingly you will get lot of information about the uh, specimen characteristics. So, some of the uh, related questions is the specimen crystalline, if it is crystalline then what are the crystallographic characteristics, is the specimen monocrystalline and if not what is the grain morphology, how large are the grains what is the grain size distribution etcetera, what is the orientation of the specimen or of individual grains with respect to electron beam, is more than one phase present in the specimen. So, some of these uh, basic questions uh, related to what I mean uh, I have put some fundamental questions uh, in the previous slide they are all related and you will be able to get all this information from the uh, diffraction. So, you have to remember in a transmission electron microscopy, diffraction is most important. In fact, the whole microscopy operates with the, uh, I mean operation lies uh, mostly on the principle of uh, diffraction. So, you have to give an importance to the uh, diffraction analysis when you really want to use this. Uh, or exploit this TEM. So, I will I will talk about uh, the importance and much more when we I mean I actually give the a practical example as well. So, uh, first look at the uh, typical uh, SAD in TEM that means selected area diffraction in TEM. So, what, what is shown in this uh, uh, photograph? So, this is a typical selected area diffraction uh, taken from this textbook. Once you have chosen the area from which you wish to obtain a diffraction pattern, 
select the required camera length that is the magnification of the diffraction pattern. So, the camera length is also called you know where whenever you turn this magnification knob in a diffraction mode that camera will I mean the camera length will increase or decrease. So, this typical uh, diffraction pattern is taken at two different camera lengths. You can see that this is the, the, the orientation of the two patterns are same, but only thing is you can see that the distance between the spots are bigger. That means, this diffraction pattern is taken at one camera length and this diffraction pattern is taken at much uh, little more uh, higher camera length. So, that is what it is. So, you have to choose a camera length of your interest. That is what it is shown here. And then I, as I said before, we have, before we do all this and that your camera length need to be calibrated and then you choose appropriate uh, camera length to do the experiments. So, diffraction using small probes. It is possible to obtain diffraction from small area. In conventional selected area diffraction, an approximately parallel electron beam is incident on the specimen. The resulting diffraction pattern from a periodic sample consists of an array of sharp, sharp spots in the back focal plane of the objective lens. So, I I as I introduced uh, using that convergent beam electron diffraction, I said we will be able to do a, a micro probe or a, a nano probe. That means, you can make the uh, probe into a micro, micron size diameter or a nano size diameter. We will also see the, the meaning of what I am saying now. How, what is the meaning of I am seeing a micro, micron size uh, beam on the screen or a nanometer size uh, screen um, beam on the screen? What is the physical meaning of it? That we will see. But then we can obtain a uh, diffraction information using this uh, either a micro probe or a nano probe from a, a localized region of our interest. That is what uh, uh, we are discussing here. Uh, in a conventional SAD, as I just mentioned, if when I when I talked about uh, a, a convergent beam or a parallel beam, I, I said that a parallel beam operation is important to in order to get a, a sharp a diffracted spot. So, that is what is shown here. In a conventional SAD, so, a parallel electron beam is incident on a specimen where you get a very sharp pattern, uh, whereas in a, in a small probe, a convergent beam has to be used. So, we will continue this discussion on the diffraction uh, uh, and, and its uh, effectiveness and also what are the details you are going to get. It is very powerful uh, a tool or I would say that powerful technique to obtain a most information about the material characteristics. We will continue in the next class. Thank you.